Good morning! This week, we are going through the second half of the Beatitudes taught by Jesus, which all have to do with the relationships with people. Today, we come to Beatitude number 7, which I consider the most beautiful of all. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Again, this Beatitude follows logically those that have gone before. Because when we confront the awfulness of sin in ourselves and in the world, when our hearts are broken by it, when we move in mercy to bring healing to a world in pain, one of the things that we would no doubt be very disturbed by is that a major uh, consequence of sin, as well as one of the chief causes of suffering, is conflict. We would become sensitized to the destruction and the misery caused by strife at every level between individuals, family members, groups, races, religions, and nations. Someone asked this question, do you know how many peace treaties have been broken? The answer is, all of them. Peace is elusive in this world, and Christians are called to a special calling to help make peace instead of war. A common mistake in interpreting this beatitude is to think of it in purely worldly terms and therefore to conceive of peacemaking as simply mediating or arbitrating or refereeing between uh, quarreling parties. This seriously misses Jesus' point. Jesus spoke of the poor in spirit, not just the materially poor, about those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, not just the hungry, about the pure in heart, not just the ceremonially pure. Similarly, Jesus is not here promoting uh, dispute resolution processes in which we uh, help people find common ground with each other or settle for compromise or even just let bygones be bygones and uh, live together uh, in harmony. The world has a very limited definition of peace. It is, simply put, an absence of conflict. Like the current situation between North and South Korea, a peace so-called peace maintained by a four-kilometer strip of no man's land, uh, bristling with mines and barbed wire, uh, with tens of thousands of combat troops on high alert on both sides, all ready to kill each other. Many of you know from personal experience that limited kind of peace in your own families, when members, some members have long since fallen out with each other, and they simply coexist under the same roof, and any minor incident can easily spark off yet another major fight. The biblical concept of peace is not defined by a negative but by a positive. Rather than just a temporary absence of conflict, biblical peace is the blissful state that only exists when God is present and His righteousness reigns. It is called Shalom. In the Old Testament, it encompasses things like harmony, prosperity, justice, wholeness, well-being, and much, much more. When one Jewish person wishes uh, on another Shalom, he is pronouncing the supreme blessing on the other person, one that is literally out of this world, this fallen world. Now that we have some idea of what Jesus means by peace, we can talk about peacemaking. For a start, because of our understanding of peace, there is no peace without returning to God's righteousness. A true peacemaker makes peace between quarreling parties by pointing them back to the kind of spiritual realities that we have talked about in the first six Beatitudes. True peace is built on a foundation of truth. A peacemaker helps people understand uh, their actual unworthy position before God so that instead of asserting themselves in pride, they are convicted to make peace in humility with one another. If you think that is unrealistic, think deeper. What is the real cause of conflict, whether at a personal, interpersonal, or uh, international level? What is the real uh, reason for conflict in the world? The Bible makes this perfectly clear in James chapter 4, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You cover it but cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. 
So ultimately, it is not unjust social conditions, misunderstandings, historical baggage, or competition for scarce resources that leads to that lead to fights and wars. It is seen lurking deep within every human heart, and there will never be true and lasting peace unless people recognize and turn away from sin to pursue the righteousness of God wholeheartedly. We can mediate and referee all we want, but if people's sin problem is not dealt with at the root, we are simply turning back the clock on a time bomb. Some of you will protest that ah, this is not possible. Uh, if the disputing parties are not Christians, and many people are not Christians, then how can true peace be possible between people? The answer is, it can't. It's foolish to think that that's even a possibility. Did you know that even Jesus couldn't restore peace to the world without bringing people back to God's righteousness? Yes, he came to bring peace on earth between peoples, but how? Did he have to go about doing it? We find the Ephesians in uh, we find the answer in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 15 to 16. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. The Prince of Peace puts to death hostility by dying for our sins so that we can receive God's righteousness. True interpersonal peace and uh, international peace can only flourish when humanity turn to the cross of Christ to receive God's righteousness. The phrase making peace in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15 is the same root word in Greek as peacemaker in the Beatitudes. That's deliberate. That's because Jesus is telling us to make peace in the same way as he did, by leading people into repentance and back to God for their salvation. The most effective and powerful way, in fact, the only real way we can be peacemakers is to share the good news of Jesus Christ so that people can have peace with God, which empowers them to have peace with one another and to live with peace with others. Evangelism is not a church program, it is a peace program. By bringing people into this new humanity, we introduce the peace of God to individuals, families, and nations. We do it not to win the world, but to win world peace. And that's why it's so blessed to be a peacemaker, for they shall be called sons of God. You note that I have deliberately not used the NIV's gender neutral term, children of God, because this beatitude clearly is a comparison to the Son of God, Jesus himself, the ultimate peacemaker. And the point is clear, we are never as like Jesus Christ as when we help restore people to God's righteousness by sharing the good news with them. There is no greater compliment and no higher joy than to be called sons of God. The story of the Bible is that God created a peaceful world which was broken by human sin. And to restore peace, God paid the highest price by giving his son so that he can uh, make peace with each one of us. Now that we have peace with God in our hearts, we seek to live a life of peace. And not only that, we become peacemakers, pointing people back to God as we look to the day when the Prince of Peace shall return and put an end to all conflicts and we shall live in an eternal shalom. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. Let us pray. Father of all peace, we come to you today. We thank you that you are the God of peace and because we have trusted in you, now we have the peace of God. Help us, Lord, even as we live in a world full of strife, even as we uh, observe all the pain and misery caused by conflict around us, that, Lord, we will be moved to act, to become peacemakers. Help us, Lord, to point people back to you, their need for you, their 
hopeless spiritual condition so that Father, they will humble themselves before you and in humbling themselves before you, they will no longer assert themselves with one another and they'll be able to make peace with one another. Thank you, God. We look, f we, we look forward to the day of the return of the Prince of Peace where he'll take us home to live in an eternal shalom forever and ever. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, we pray all this. Amen. Thank you for joining me for Morning Devotions. I'll see you again tomorrow morning. Till then, God bless you and Shalom.